All right, I'm back from two weeks of vacation here with Charles Haywood to kick off the new regime. Either way we went, we had a new president when I got home, and uh, I tried with all my might not to find out who it was, but uh, with uh, two days left on my journey, it was inevitable. I walk into the hotel, and they're playing CNN. So I uh, I did find out that Trump won the election. Um, people tried to tell me I was out in Atosha at the National Park up in Atosha watching all the wild animals run around and people would try to bring it up up there. And I would tell them, no, I don't care. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I'll find out when I get home, I got it set up where my buddy's going to tell me. And, uh, so, but I, I did find out that Trump did win the election, which wasn't a big surprise to me. I kind of had a feeling that's the direction that we were leaning in, but, um, uh, Charles Haywood's here to fill me in on all the gruesome details of what I missed between, October 27th and November 11th and uh what what uh we can expect going forward as Trump picks his cabinet and um uh, gets ready for his uh second term as president of the United States. So Charles, it's great to have you. It's great to be the first person I talk to on any political matters. Be the great Charles Haywood. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and this is the you're the first person I've talked to about post-election other than on Twitter and my mom and my my family. So this is certainly the first kind of public appearance with any thoughts I may have on the uh, the election after the election. So uh, hopefully they'll be reasonably coherent. No, I'm sure you will be. You always are. I'm the one who blabbers on about nonsense all the time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you missed, so you missed the last, what, two weeks, Almost, almost a full two weeks before the election. Yeah, I was sure like, I, uh, I was gone for about, I think we're at 15 days now. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not sure I can give you all the gruesome details. Uh, and, and actually, the details in the run-up to the election weren't all that gruesome. Uh, you know, people kept waiting for the October surprise. And I think the October surprise was meant to be that you know fantastical set of lies they came up with that, that Trump once said that he wished he had generals like Adolf Hitler which, you know, A, he didn't say, but B, if he did say it, it would be like perfectly reasonable because, you know, Adolf Hitler's generals are much better than the generals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, that's just an objective fact. Like we have, you know, we have like military men who suck. But uh, I, I don't know, were you here for, for example, for, Mc, for Trump's uh, McDonald's serving? Yeah, I saw that. That was like one of the last things I saw. I did see there was like some... Uh, it was like Jesse on fire did a video saying that there was some new chick that came out saying that she was molested by Trump or something. I don't know what was going on oh, with yeah, that. No, I, 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 that popped up. It was gone in a couple hours. I, I think it, uh, she, she said something like I was coming back from a party at Jeffrey Epstein's town home in like 1993 or 1994. She couldn't remember the year. Uh, uh, but it turned out that, that he had bought that town home like three years after that. So she was just obviously lying. Oh, uh, geez. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, she, you know, I mean, that, it's just incompetence too. Like, you know, those are facts that are fairly easy to look up. But like, apparently, the people who cook up these lies, you know, weak October surprises, can't be bothered to check public records about crucial facts for their, for their, uh, for their story. So uh, there was no October surprise. Um, I wasn't really expecting one because with Trump, all his skeletons are not in the closet, but are dancing on full display. And so it's very difficult to come up with something that is, that has any traction. I mean, unlike all these other people who are in Diddy's party videos or Epstein's party videos, Trump is not on any of those things, mm. uh, both by his nature, but also because we would have known about it uh, a, a long time ago, obviously. Uh, so it, it really wasn't that much exciting in, in the run-up to the election. Uh, I mean, I've been saying for well over a year that Trump's essentially certain to win unless he dies and he didn't die. So he won. And yeah. if you're asking me the day off, I'm like, they were, what's your confidence level? I'm like, hi, of course. But I just didn't think they had the wherewithal to, to do the necessary amount of cheating. And it was pretty obvious Trump would, would win without that. They did do some cheating, like in the Wisconsin Senate race, but not enough to, to not because they didn't want to, but because of lack of capability and diminishing returns. And so obviously Trump won. I mean, Harris was a weak candidate. Waltz was, a, you know, a, you know, obviously effeminate 
loser. I mean, they, they picked bad candidates, but you know, Trump was going to win because he's Trump, not because of the candidates they picked. I was sitting next to a golf pro on, on the plane from Heathrow to um, Houston. And uh, he asked me, he said, what do you think about it? You know, I, I said, I tried not to pay too much attention to it. And I found out like a, the day before I left South Africa, I found out what had happened. Um, and, but, but I, I was like, I don't really know all of what went, went down the last couple of weeks of the election. And he, he's like, well, what do you think? Why do you think Trump won? Do you think if Biden would have dropped out earlier and there would have been a democratic primary that there would have been a closer race that the Democrats would have had a better chance, et cetera, et cetera. I said, that's very possible. There are probably stronger democratic candidates than Kamala Harris. I said, uh, but from what I understand and from everything I heard before I left, like the reason that Biden wasn't dropping out is because they were afraid that if they passed over Kamala Harris because of how weak she was and how unliked she was, she wasn't popular in any, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, she was very unpopular. And, um, I was like, so they, they didn't feel like they could pass her over for the opportunity to run for president, uh, due to identity politics. So I don't feel like they felt like they had a choice until after the debate went so terrible for Biden. And, and he was like, oh, that makes sense. I was like, yeah, I was like, because everybody is so obsessed with identity in the United States that they couldn't have gone with a Gavin Newsom or someone like that. It, it would have just looked bad on the Democrats because then they would have just been stabbing themselves in the back, you know, for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was surprised that Biden dropped out. I think they got enough to threaten him with. I was predicting he would not drop out. But after he dropped out, uh, I think the arc was pretty obvious. Uh, and predetermined, uh, as you say. I mean, it, it was also pretty obvious early on that it was, it was there's no way they were able to levitate for, for months on end. I mean, you can do a propaganda campaign for a couple of weeks and so on. Mm. Uh, but given the kind of uh, hot, very high distrust that Americans quite rightly have in media and other related institutions, you, you can run a propaganda campaign but the only people who are going to be buy into it past a certain point are the people who are going to vote for her anyway. It's like yeah. the COVID, right? You know, there's always going to be some people who think, who still swallow the official COVID propaganda line, but they're the same people who are who would swallow anything. That if they reverse the propaganda line 180 degrees, would would swallow that too. Those people don't matter. The people who are just kind of, I mean, they're kind of the, the lumpen proletariat. Uh, but the rest of the country for voting kind of thing matters. And, and they obviously weren't going to be hoodwinked for months on end. I was actually shocked whenever I was, whenever I was on, on my trip, how many people, I, like when I would see somebody wear a mask, I'd be like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> I know, like I would, I would just have this like physical reaction to seeing someone wear a mask. I was like, Oh geez, I don't want to get near that person. <laughs> In like a big city, like New York or Chicago, are, are any significant number of people still wearing masks? I saw it mainly at the airport. I didn't go into like New York or Chicago, but I saw it at the airport. I, I, and, and like one of the, uh, one of the flight attendants, um, he wore a mask the entire trip between South Africa and Heathrow airport in London. It was just so, I was, I was like, I don't want to talk to you. Like most male flight attendants, he is no doubt immune compromised from his you know, other activities. So maybe he was smart. <laughs> he was, he wasn't wearing the mask to stop COVID. He was trying to stop monkey pox. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I mean, that was true. Uh, I identified this. I remember I wrote a piece in May of 2020 pointing out that the categories of people who actually were affected by COVID highly negatively were obvious. I mean, old mm. people, fat people, and male homosexuals. Oh, I mean, so if you looked at any news story about a person died or dying of COVID, 100% of the people who died always turned out to be one of those three categories. Uh, and you know, people like you and me, yeah, you know, I mean, people got like really sick, like from the flu, kind of really sick. But the people who were actually dying were just a certain subset of people. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. <clears throat> but I think we beat COVID horse to death. That's one of those that's one of those topics I try to not talk about anymore. But I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I I totally agree with that. But on the other hand, it's also true that it, it, it's sad that people are moving on because it, it, we're never going to get the necessary tribunals. But what you're going to do? 
Yeah, there. I mean, there were. I did in the airport, like in um, I think it was the yeah, it was the Namibian airport. I saw uh signs for COVID nineteen still up, and I was like, what Weird. What is going on? <laughs> but you know, I mean, as far as technology and stuff, they are. You know, they're probably like fifty years behind us, so maybe they're behind on the COVID nineteen. Maybe it just got to them. Maybe. <laughs> so, um. As far as like, okay, so as far as the one thing I noticed that that I did did see was Trump winning the popular vote. When I saw that, I was like, oh, shit, you know, like, that's a big deal. Because I think wasn't the last Republican to win the popular vote, Ronald Reagan? No, I, I heard it was George W. Bush in maybe 2004. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, it, it, it wasn't even close. I don't know what the final account is. And obviously you have to discount it a little bit for the cheating, uh, even in the states where it wasn't important determinative outcomes. There's some marginal amount of cheating and fake votes. But it, 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 it was actually, uh, I didn't really think about it, but I probably would not have predicted that Trump would win the, the popular vote. Um, it, so that was even more impressive than I think that uh, people who are bullish on Trump thought was going to happen. Definitely a referendum on uh, democratic policies of the last, let's say, 20 years. Well, I mean, it, it, it's funny, like this was totally predictable in a sense because the 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 flailing nature of it, the kind of incompetence of it all. And you saw like bits and pieces of this. And I used to, I was making the joke in the last couple of weeks of the election that somewhere in a basement, somewhere James Carville is screaming in the dark because you know the competent people who are used to be or reasonably competent people who used to be in charge of the Democratic Party were all sidelined in favor of people chosen by identity or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. I saw an analysis, for example, of of the 10 or so people who are Kamala Harris's inner circle. I mean, you've never heard of any of these people. You're never going to hear about any of these people. Complete non-entities, like just you know, people with no accomplishments to their name. They just like hitch, hitch their wagon at some point to Harris's star, but they're nobodies. I mean, they never accomplished anything in life or in politics, and now they're going to disappear because the people who were really good at this stuff, like Carville, who's old now, obviously, is... Uh, yeah, he has, hasn't publicly commented, but you know he's pissed because he spent decades of his life trying to build democratic majorities and so on to see them flush down the drain. So, uh, but there's no way back. I mean, there's no there's no universe, I don't think, in which the Democratic Party sees the light. And you you kind of see this already that a lot, most elements of the left coalition are doubling down on leftism rather than saying, well, we need to we need to do a Bill Clinton triangulation even a fake triangulation they just they just don't want to do it they you know, the permanent mm -hmm. that said you know i've been very not bullishly but aggressively for many months predicting not only that trump will win but that the reaction will be left violence and a coup attempt as well though that's a separate prediction than than left violence i mean maybe maybe that'll happen but it cer certainly hasn't happened yet and and i would have if you had asked me i would have said i expect it to be immediate Although I don't think I specifically made that prediction, but that's what I, that's what I would have said. And you know, here we are, nothing happening, which is fine. You know, I like no violence, uh, you know, though. You know, sometimes it gives you an excuse to put down your enemies. But uh, uh, on balance, it's much better to have no violence. And so far, we don't have any. Right. Well, that's surprising. I mean i I figured the I figured it would be worse than 2016. Yeah. Oh, and 2020, you know, I expected it to be some multiple of the Floyd riots, the only in in kind of left wing areas where they control the courts and the prosecutors and so on. But nothing. I mean, yeah, there's been a few like vaguely half hearted attempts at demonstrations or something, but I mean, nothing of any substance. Whatsoever. So no pussy hats are popping up or anything like that. No, I, mean, I remember I have a video somewhere in 2016, like mid November. They had a giant march in New York City down Fifth Avenue. And mm -hmm. I was there in New York for business. And so I, I have a video of myself stepping out in the street uh, next to all these marchers and screaming, Trump rules! Uh, <laughs> Trump! Uh, uh, and uh, we don't. I don't even have a march I can go to that, uh, that I can yell at anymore. <laughs> I mean, maybe I will, but uh, first of all, I'm not going to go to New York because New York's a, you know, 
shithole. But um, it's uh, if I did, there's no march to be had. No one is doing marches anymore, apparently. Mm. So what do you what do you think that means? Is it just an acceptance that okay, they're like our our points of view are so unpopular that we're going to have to recalibrate, or is it like let's just bide our time? What's interesting, I don't know, is the short answer, but right after Biden dropped out, I mean, Biden dropped out unexpectedly. There's no grand plan to these things. And for maybe 10 days after that, the left-wing media complex and all the regime mouthpieces were very confused because they hadn't received any instructions. There was no clear. And so people would actually say things that, that made sense. For example, there was a lot of talk about how it was impossible to have Kamala Harris because she was going to be totally terrible and everyone hated her. And so that you, you had a lot of kind of truth telling, but also just a sense of confusion among the regime mouthpieces, which are used to having very specific directions, uh, either explicit or implicit, it kind of, you know, like a flock of school of fish moving around. And they had nothing. They had no idea what to do. They, you know, mm. Obama was behind the scenes pushing for somebody else and everyone knew this, but you, know, you couldn't talk about it. And you get a little bit of the same feeling. Like, they don't know what to say. I mean, they they know that they have to not crumble, at least not yet, on the most extreme left-wing things. And so you you have you know, people say they're still policing CNN for transphobia, you know, things like that. So there's no indication that they're, they're triangulating. Uh, on the other hand, there's no indication they're, they're ginning up for a bunch of riots either. They just seem to, maybe it's just they're shell-shocked. May, I mean, it, it, there of course, there is no like central command center, a Dr. Evil type command center for this. It's, it's an emergent property of a bunch of people. But you'd love to know what, say, Obama, who is not nearly as powerful as people say he is, but is a relevant player in left politics. You know, what is Obama sitting around saying and thinking? I mean, he's, he, 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 it's very difficult to imagine because he, he's wedded his life to extreme left wing politics, obviously under the veneer of moderation. Mm -hmm. And a guy like that isn't likely to say, oh, yeah, uh, I was wrong. People don't want that crap. Uh, we need to do something totally different and be nice to white people. I mean, you know, that, that's just not, not, not. So, but what is he saying? Oh, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, why is he, is he drinking? Is he like hanging out with rent boys? I don't know. I mean, you know, what, what does he do? I, I just don't know. And, and it's, it's very curious to me because like, what is George Soros doing and his odious little, little toad son? I mean, what are they doing? I, 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 they must be making plans, but what are those plans? I mean, at some point, it's like it's like a guy who's a, been condemned to execution the next morning. I mean, he can make plans all he wants, but those plans don't have any reality to them. And so you got to wonder if you don't have any... Yeah, I mean, maybe the, the obvious plan would be well, we're going to do the same thing we did last time. We're going to come up with a bunch of lies and fake scandals and tie Trump down. Well, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not real likely to work. People don't believe the crap anymore. Trump's obviously on guard for that. That's not a great strategy. I mean, there's just no good, there's no good play here. I mean, even the kind of, I mean, it was obvious that they hoped that Trump would be assassinated, but now if they try to assassinate Trump, they'll get J.D. Vance, which is even yeah. worse for <laughs> yeah, it's probably better for us and worse for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so I, I, I'd really be curious to be like a fly on the wall of the Zoom calls of the intelligent side of the left coalition, like Obamas and and people like that. I mean, obviously, the, the kind of HR heritons and so on are all sitting around screeching about it, whatever they screech about. Those people aren't important. But the, the people who decide what the next NPC download for the regime is going to be, as kind of a set of emergent properties from what it is they say in public. Uh, I have no idea what those people are thinking. None. It's bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre. Maybe they're, maybe they're thinking they can uh, leverage like the Senate against Trump or something like that. Yeah. But I, it, when you live your whole life, hoping for revolution and mass change leading to utopia, you know, it's not really inspiring to say, let's leverage Republican moderates in the Senate to slightly de decelerate Trump's agenda. I mean, that's not a, that's that's not a very like Lenin would not. Wait, they don't they don't have the they don't have the the Senate. They don't have the No, the Republicans control the House and the Senate. Oh, shit. Yeah. 
Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I know I didn't know it. Not know that at all. I didn't know anything about the Senate or anything. They've been cheat, busy trying to cheat. They stole the Wisconsin Senate election or another one of these like ballot drops in the middle of the night, and mm. then I think they may have stolen another Senate election too in Arizona. So it really should be like 54, 46 in the Senate, but I think it's going to be like 52, 48. You know, 54 have been a lot better because we have these, you know, traitor Republicans like Murkowski and so on who will stab us in the back for anything important. But it is what it is. And uh, and then um, in the House, it's it's really close. They're still you know, cheating there uh, in California and, and, and places. But you know, again, as I thought, their cheating isn't enough to to prove the, the difference in the main kind of binary decisions. So yeah, so and the argument over the past couple of days, and much of this is opaque and taking place in secret, is who's going to be the new Senate majority leader? I think uh, I think McConnell is still in the Senate, but apparently he's no he's either stepping down as he must be stepping down as majority leader because he's about to die. And uh and so supposedly three people are up. This is a secret ballot and two of them are very anti-Trump, Thune and Cornyn. So the John Cornyn, yeah. Oh, John um, Cornyn is horrible. Yeah. So and they're, so they're both terrible, and so they're both. You know, people have been digging out their old tweets like anti-Trump and pro-George Floyd and all these kind of things. I mean, they're just terrible. I mean, these people. I mean, why these people are are allowed in the Senate by the states that like them is completely beyond me. So that will be indicative of Trump's ability to get things done. But ultimately, in some ways, the legislation matters less because. For Trump, to, in order to be able to accomplish things, he obviously has to stay disciplined and have good advisors and so on, but fundamentally needs to use executive power. And so, for example, when he very soon, just in the nature of things, it doesn't even have to be a left plan, Trump will say, well, this is my my new plan to deport illegal immigrants. And immediately some judge will, will say, you can't do that, but come back to me in three years when it's litigated and we'll talk about it. If he doesn't immediately say, I refuse to obey this order, this judge is illegitimate and a traitor, and I'm going to go ahead and do it, then his administration is over. So passing legislation is important and that's great and so on if he can get it. But fundamentally, Trump has to use his executive power in a way that no Republican has used executive power ever. Uh, except for like Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> yeah. so, which was a while ago. And so uh, if he doesn't do that, it doesn't matter what the who's the Senate majority leader, because he'll he'll be hobbled. And if he does do that, the legislation will follow along because everyone everyone will go the way a winner is going. So fundamentally, Trump has to smash the ability of the left to hobble him using judicial uh, methods, you know, traitor judges trying to block his agenda. Has he made any decisions on how he's going to do that? I mean, I understand like he's got Vivek Ramaswamy kind of like feeding him information. You got JD Vance there who can feed him information. Um, I'm not sure what Elon's role will be, but how, how will he uh, manage executively this time around because the last time around with Mike Pence as his vice president, I was pretty aware that it was like, well, this is like hopeless. Like what, what are we doing here? <laughs> and like no. Mike Pompeo and you know, John Bolton and all these guys, you know, it's kind of like, all right, you, you like basically like you have a cuck executive administration going in. Very much. So. I mean, he's already publicly ruled out Pompeo, which is good. And Nikki Haley as having any role in the administration. Oh, because they're good. Good. Yeah. I forgot about her. Yeah, that's another one. Um, the uh, Well, I don't have any inside knowledge. And if I did have inside knowledge, I wouldn't run around saying it on camera. Um, you know, or that I had inside knowledge. I, I have not. to try, man. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, the, you know, obviously, these things are um, uh, better so far than last time around. And for example, Jared and Ivanka, who are terrible influences, uh, and very important influences are officially having no rule, nothing in administration. And there, he's already announced that his border czar is this guy, Homan, who's super aggressive. Stephen Miller, Miller is going to be deputy chief of staff. His chief of staff is this woman, Susan Wiles, who is his campaign manager, who I literally never heard of before that announcement mm -hmm. uh, because I don't pay much attention. But apparently she's you know, all the all the people that I trust say say that she's great. Um, so a lot of the picks that... All the picks that have been officially announced, which is only a handful, seem to be really good. 
they floated some some things that are supposedly happening, like Marco Rubio for state, which don't sound so good. But I mean, Marco Rubio at state, yeah, okay, Marco Rubio is a, is far more aggressive about things than I would be. But Trump never promised he was going to be a foreign policy isolationist. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd like Trump to do certain things with respect to foreign policy, but he's not going to do the things that I want to do because they basically consist of having no soldiers outside of our borders. <laughs> That's just not, I mean, Trump's not going to do that. I mean, right. I mean, and, and so Marco Rubio can do less damage at state, especially because the State Department is a classic example of a of a uh, government department that has to take direction from the president uh, because it, it, the, the president, it's so public that the president's, uh, it, it, at least at the highest levels, the president's initiatives have to take precedence, unlike in some other places where you're out of sight, is out of mind, and they just you know, stab the president in the back continuously. So we'll see. I mean, all these people. So, for example, people who are like, well, the United States needs to stop supporting Israel. How dare Trump support Israel? The Jews have conquered him. I mean, I'm like, like wh whoever thought Trump, I mean, Trump has been like 100 percent clear that he's going to aggressively support Israel, probably more so than Biden. I mean, that's just what you get. I mean, that's what you get mm. for voting. I mean, and that's just the way it is. So, so to imagine that he's going to all of a sudden appoint someone who who is anti-Israel to the State Department is, is silly. Um, so, so far, so good. Uh, he seems to be a lot more disciplined. He's making all the right statements. He's surrounding himself with the right people. Uh, so certainly to an outside observer, such as I am, that, that seems like good things are happening. Mm. So <clears throat> has he announced anything for Robert Kennedy Jr., Tulsi Gabbard, Vivek Ramaswamy? I know they were important during the campaign. Does it seem like they're going to be important during the administration? Well, there's a lot of rumors flying around. You can never tell when those things are, 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 yeah, presumably. I mean, RFK Jr. is, I think, guaranteed to have something because yeah, I think he was very explicit in his quid pro quo with Trump. That And, and obviously, and I think, from, I mean, I don't know what Trump thinks, but if I was Trump, I would say, well, yeah, RFK Jr. wants to go into like USDA and health and human services and these things, which need a good ass kicking anyway. So let him go and do do those things. And you know, does Trump really care about eating healthy and fluoride? No, but you know, he, he knows that a lot of people do, and that RFK is going to kick ass and take names. So why okay. not? I mean, who else are you going to appoint to USDA? I mean, some farm bureaucrat. I mean, you need you need someone who's going to now. Obviously, there's huge numbers of people who hate that. The big farmer people and the big, you know, agriculture people. So it'll be interesting to see if, if, for example, Kennedy gets completely sidelined. That's a really bad sign because it suggests that these these people with money and influence have have gotten inside Trump's decision making loop. Uh, mm. We'll see. I, I don't have any insight into that, but you know, I mean, all, all the big farmer people, as far as I'm concerned, should be hung up by their thumbs and lashed with a wet noodle. Uh, for their for their various forms of misbehavior, and RFK is probably the the guy to do it, even if I don't agree with him on a bunch of other stuff. Right, I was thinking he'd probably be like EPA um, because of his his experience as an environmental attorney. I don't think he wants that, right? Because EPA is all about like big company air pollution regulation. I think he's much mm -hmm. more interested in stuff that affects like end consumers and in, in the, okay. in the food chain. Uh, 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 they were floating this morning Lee Zeldin I'm not sure who that is but apparently is a very uh, anti-global warming hoax person for head of the EPA so gotcha. uh, and it sounded if that's actually true as a pick calculated to make all the right people mad so uh, that's good yeah yeah I know, I know the name you say it it's like okay that's a familiar name but I couldn't tell you where I know him from or what I know about him I'd even be a woman. I mean, Lee can be sometimes, sometimes is a girl's name. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, could be a woman for all I know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a familiar name. I've heard it before, yeah. but I, I couldn't tell you where from. So is there anything else that's like it? So, so far everything's looking pretty good. As yeah. far as I, I, I'm, I don't think it could be going any better at this point. The most of the, other than Trump's election and his selection of Vance, everything is kind of meaningless, ephemera at this point. Not everything and not completely meaningless, but we're in that kind of chaotic transition stage. You have to wait till things kind of get settled. And you also have to see how Trump reacts to crises. If, if you, in a crisis, he 
relies on the wrong people, moves in the wrong direction, that'll be indicative. Everyone seems to think, and again, I don't have inside knowledge, but that Trump, especially with the assassination attempts, has and but also just his experience of the past four, eight years, <clears throat> has changed significantly and changed in good ways. That doesn't mean that he's perfect. Yeah, I think he retains a lot of the you know, haphazard, undisciplined ways that, that caused him problems last time. But it, it, as I say, early returns are good, but it'll take a couple months to really see what happens. Okay. Okay. So we're still waiting on Homeland Security, Secretary of State. Um, a bunch. Secretary of Defense. Yeah. CIA. Secretary of Defense. Yeah. The head of CIA. So oh, did- some of the more important roles are still yet to be filled. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's all the roles are important at some level or another. I don't, but I, I tend not to pay enough attention to day-to-day governance of these things, of the the way Washington works to, to really kind of keep a scorecard. But I am curious <clears throat> how it's going to play out. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm just, can, I'm just wondering, like, it's hard to tell by the campaign that Trump ran and what I saw of his campaign, what what exactly he learned from his first term and how that's going to direct his second term. Now I, I did think the the choosing of JD Vance, making Elon Musk, Tulsi Gabbard, and RFK Jr. such influential figures within his campaign, I think I think that's indicative of, of him learning something. I'm just not sure exactly what it is that he learned. And so I'm curious to see the types of figures that enter these, especially when it comes to foreign policy and, and making these decisions and, and who he's going to put in charge and how he's going to um, move forward with foreign policy. I think that's right. But I think the kind of tell that's most important is the migration uh, and his his borders are, and Stephen Miller is going to be deputy chief of staff, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, both those people are as anti-migration as you can get, and very explicitly and aggressively. So, so and Trump has not let up on talking about mass deportations and so on. Fundamentally, Trump's, while well, the foreign policy is important, Trump was elected to deport people. And he doesn't deport people starting on day one, as well as do other important things like pardon and pay reparations to all of the January 6th heroes, you know, he, he, it's going to be indicative that he's not going to be a serious governing force. And if he does do those things, then he's he is going to be a, a serious governing force. It's really the foreign policy is kind of downstream of that. Well, I think the I think what people worry about with the foreign policy more so than anything is people are paying attention to the amount of money that is being sent overseas versus what's being invested in the country. And so that's going to be very, it's going to be very important. I think you're right about the deportation and, and the, the immigration policy in general. I, if if I had to guess though, if Trump can, can get back to um, the Keystone pipeline, drilling oil here in the U S get the deportation deportations underway and begin working that Southern border and also cut down the amount of money that the United States is sending overseas to fund other countries. I think that determines whether or not you have like a JD Vance or Vivek Ramaswamy presidency in 2028, or if you have a Gavin Newsom presidency in 2028. No, I think that's, that's true. I I would add to that. The tariffs are important. That is to the extent you want America to, to rebuild and start doing things, uh, that matter rather than funneling money overseas. It's not just the fund direct funding of other people. It's rebuilding the American manufacturing base and making us less reliant on foreign countries for everything from weapons to medicines. And the only way to do that is aggressive tariffs. The shrieking from the moneyed interests, you know, corporations and so on, who who would then be less able to make money by having cheap labor and importing cheap goods from abroad is going to be intense. But I think the, the tariffs, very aggressive tariffs are also important. 
the difficulty there is that you can have to get that. That is a legislative thing. It's very limited ability of the executive to simply impose those. So that mm. would be a real, and those people are all in the pocket of the moneyed interests, or most of them are. So uh, I'll be skeptical that you can actually get tariffs through, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. I, John Cornyn would definitely be an issue um, with, with something like that. He's, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he's Mitch McConnell 2.0. He's, he's no different. He's basically a moderate Democrat in Republican clothing. Um, so uh, I don't know how he keeps winning here in Texas. It's just nobody really challenges him on the Republican side. Yeah, I mean, it's your fault. Come on. Just, I don't vote. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's hard enough to get me to leave the house to go to work. <laughs> I have some sympathy for that. But nonetheless, you know, he... he the people of Texas are responsible. Right. So, I mean. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't understand how he continues to win, but they don't, they don't put anybody up. That's, that's worth a shit, you know, that that's competing against them. And it's kind of like, okay, like, what are we looking at here? We're looking at Democrat or Democrat light, you know, yeah. as far as that race goes. So. Well, people follow the strong horse. Right. So if Trump is radically successful, People like Cornyn, while they may try to work against him behind closed doors, will largely fall in line. So nothing succeeds like success. So a lot depends upon how Trump does in the first three to six months, and even in the time before he's inaugurated, because if he's perceived as the guy who's winning, moving, making things happen, the people who might otherwise oppose him openly will either not oppose him or oppose him less openly. And that's obviously to be desired. And in some kind of ideal world, Trump faces a crisis that he can use to increase his power and make himself look better. But of course, crises are always risky for everyone involved. Hmm. Where was there? Uh, did Kamala ever go on Joe Rogan? Did that ever happen? Oh no! In fact, it came out yesterday. Rogan was talking about a no, and she. It came out before the election that she. Uh, wanted Rogan to fly to her and to limit it to an hour. But it came out after the election. She also demanded uh, the ability to edit it after the fact and to dictate the content of it beforehand. So, I mean, that's obviously not serious kind of thing. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that was the wrong calculation. I, I mean, it was bad for her. She didn't go on it, but it probably would have been worse had she gone on it. And I mean, she would have gotten vaporized just by talking. I mean, Rogan wouldn't even had to be mean to her. He just would have let her talk. So that was the right call, I think, for them not to put her on. But that really hurt her. I mean, Vance went on there, too. And I mean, I didn't watch either because I don't have time to watch three-hour things, even at 2x speed. And I, I kind of know most of this stuff already. I, I did see some highlights. But Vance did a great job as well. And, of course, Waltz did not go on Rogan because you know, he's a loser, too. It, it really is, and this is not hardly an original point of mind, but the Musk spends all his days crowing on X about how you're the new media, you're the media now. And, and that's true. Like, yeah, there are a bunch of people who are still kind of under the sway of CNN and legacy media, but it's getting smaller every day. That, mm. that was something that was interesting in the, there were two interesting data points that I saw. One, just apropos of nothing is Guess which ethnic group in America voted by the highest percentage for uh, for Trump? Which ethnic group by the highest percentage voted for Trump? I would say it would be whites. Nope. No. It wasn't so Latino. The, Latinos did go heavily, for, uh, go much more for Trump than in the past. It was black people? Nope. It was American Indians. Really? Uh, I thought I thought that was really interesting. I'm, I'm curious why that is. That I mean, it was 65 percent according to an exit poll I saw of American Indians voted for uh, for Trump, and it was 57 percent of white people. Uh, so I, th I thought that was uh, that was uh, interesting. Um, that is the, interesting. Uh, what, the, what was the other uh, interesting thing that uh, that came out of the election? Um, oh yeah, that that Gen X people and Gen Z people even more voted heavily for Trump. So for years, we've been told the left are getting, the young are getting more and more left wing. In fact, the only people who held the line for the left were boomers. 
uh, because I think a large part of that was because boomers are still under the influence of these you know, the lying legacy media. And as they die off, it, it, no one in Gen Z watches you know, nightly news. They listen right. to Rogan. And, and so you see kind of the power of this. It's not so much they listen to Rogan. It's that they listen to Rogan and other stuff and they actually make up their minds rather than receiving downloads from the regime media. And, and so it's not really surprising in retrospect that boomers, who everyone thinks of as a Trump stronghold, actually were against Trump, though I can't remember the exact statistics, whereas Gen Z people were heavily in favor of Trump and Gen Z men were like wildly in favor of Trump. I mean, so, uh, I mean, Gen Z women, I think, were, are, you see the sex divide, as you see in some other countries where women become more and more left wing and men become more and more right wing. And so you're definitely, definitely seeing that. That's a terrible thing for the, for the Democrats and for the left wing, because once you've been bitten by the reality bug, it's not like the next election, those same men are going to be like, oh, well, never mind. I think you know MSNBC is telling me the truth and I should listen to them. There's just mm. no way back. More likely, the young women will be like, well, this this uh, path is getting me nothing but I'm going to become a frumpy wine aunt and none of the, uh, mm. I'll have a sad life if I continue down this path. So maybe I should become right wing too. It, people are always negative about you know, people, but like you hear these people repeal the 19th Amendment. And, you know, I, I always joke that I don't think women should be denied the vote. I think everyone should be denied the vote. But <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the the historically women actually tend to vote right wing. And uh, you know, this is not necessarily a, a analogy or parallel that people people want to draw. But famously, like 98 percent of German women supported Hitler. Uh, I mean, just some ludicrous percentage. So it's not that some, it, we, we, again, like the old people and the young people, we're told that it's a natural fact of life. The young people are left wing and the women are left wing. That's ah, just BS. I mean, you wake up one day and all the young people and all the women are going to be right wing and the only left wing people are going to be some like aging white homosexuals. It's going to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about millennials? Uh, you didn't mention them in your, in that. I think they were, I think they were somewhere in between. It was definitely the younger people, even the youngest cohort who was the most pro-Trump. But like mm -hmm. also Latinos, I can't remember, I don't know if it was an absolute majority, but vastly greater numbers for Trump and the Republicans than the past. I mean, uh, to a degree that, again, I mean, it's been, this has been kind of obvious for some time that that Latinos are not a reliable Democratic voting bloc. Mm -hmm. And obviously Latino is a huge category, right? I mean, you have, obviously in Texas, you have, Latinos who have been there for hundreds of years, right. who are a totally different category from Latinos from, I guess, Venezuela and illegal migrants count as Latinos too. But I'm pretty sure that Tejanos <laughs> are not down with like Venezuelan illegal migrants. So it's a large category. So I don't know what the subdivisions are. For, but if my guess is if we can deport the recent migrants, uh, well, that the share of Latinos voting right will probably go up. Mm. Okay. The only group that not really changed was black people. I mean, black women only voted like eight percent for Trump, and I think black men fifteen percent. Uh I, I mean, yeah, I think the if I was the Republicans, I mean, just spending time chasing the black vote doesn't make a lot of sense. I, mean, I think, like as with Latinos, when black people see policies that benefit them in the long run, they'll start to vote right rather than pandering to people promising them whatever i don't i mean you know it doesn't mean i mean for example in chicago which i know a fair bit about because i used to live there the mayor now something brandon johnson uh who's a, he's a real you know kind of dumb but professional politician he's in tons of hot water with his black constituents because they're all like what the hell is all this illegal migrants flooding into our neighborhoods and taking all them because Johnson spends hundreds of millions of dollars shoveling it to these illegal migrants and all these black people who have lived in Chicago for a hundred years are like, what, why is, why is the black man being, being set aside for this, this guy who snuck across the border last week? If I, if I was a Republican, I would focus on those kind of policies that benefit mm. black people and hope they start voting Republican. Well, I don't, I don't know if you pay attention to comedy at all, but there's a comedian named Cam Patterson and he yeah. had a great, he had a great bit after Trump got shot. He said, wait, he ran an illegal college and conned a bunch of people out of money. He's a felon. 
and he's been shot. Is this motherfucker my uncle? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it, it's a variation and it varies across cultures, but it's a variation on the strong horse. That is, mm. you, you hear this and maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I don't know enough, but Latino, Latino men in particular, like strong leaders. They don't like Tim Walls, who's, you know, walking around, you know, limp wristed. Yeah. Uh, you know, they like a guy who tells it like like he sees it and stands behind his statements. And they may not agree with him, but they, they have a certain respect for that. And that, I mean, that's the way all politics used to be when when politics was male coded, which it, which it should be, obviously. That is the idea of feminine characteristics leaking into political discourse. That is conformity, hiding your your real views and rather than having open argumentation you know, the long house of politics is a terrible way to do politics. So it's not really surprising that the groups which are less long housed uh, than than white educated men uh, are, are becoming somewhat more right wing. Whether that trend will continue, I don't know. If we start putting out losers as our candidates, but now we have a vice president with facial hair. So we're, we're making progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you uh what do you what do you get um uh, about this this move by the by the kind of the tech ceos over to the right while it seems like every other ceo is moving to the left what do you make of that well i think the it, it, it's not clear to me that the, every other ceo is moving to the left except in the fact that most ceos don't actually do anything most CEOs are completely worthless human beings who have no actual impact on their company. And you see that it's kind of a variation on Musk firing 80% of Twitter as well as its CEO. I mean, the CEO of Twitter was a worthless human being who did nothing but negative, created negative value for Twitter. And that's true for most CEOs. So te- it's not so much tech CEOs, it's CEOs who are actually capable of accomplishment. That just happens to be more so in the tech world than it, than it used to be. I mean, that said, you know, Tim Cook at Apple or that guy who runs Microsoft, from those people have no accomplishments. If they died tomorrow, I would have no impact whatsoever on the success of the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not really the tech CEOs. It's a subset of tech CEOs who are super competent and actually capable of running companies and creating value. And they're basically a junior versions of Musk in the sense that they have certain goals in life and they've come to see that they can't accomplish those if the left maintains mm-hmm. its ascendancy. Musk obviously is the most extreme version of that. And I like to take a victory lap in my predictions about Musk's arc. I, I wrote a piece like a year and a half ago predicting that he would he would affirmatively challenge the regime, which is, has come true certainly mm. so far, um, because he wants to get to Mars. And when they tell you it, it, that you can't, uh, how you know, who you can hire for your company, for example, and tie you up in regulation, you're never going to get to Mars. So uh, I, I make of it that the a the people in America who really want to get things done are moving rightward. The problem is that the amount of inertia and opposition to that is enormous. I mean, there are literally tens of millions of people who 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 are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars each, maybe not tens of millions, hundreds of thousands, but tens of millions of people whose livelihood depends on continuing in a job that destroys social value every time they wake up in the morning. That is, if they simply were were paid the same amount to sit in their bed, society would become hugely better off as a result. So until those people are thrown out of their jobs and made to get an actual productive job, perhaps in the new American factories that will be created after giant tariffs are imposed, these tech people will be unable to get to their goals, except in a narrow sense. I mean, Musk might be able to do it because he has narrow enough goals that he can scrape together the right people if he's not hobbled. But the he knows perfectly well that, for example, under the so-called current civil rights regime, he's not allowed to hire the most competent people. He has to hire all these people who are d- dead weight on his companies because otherwise he'll be he'll be sued uh, or put in jail. So the tech people is the early stages of people trying to overthrow the system and allow America to become great again. Uh, maybe I'll trademark that phrase, make America great again. And uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and Tech people are merely the most visible evidence of that. But even like someone like me, I'm a minor, former businessman. But I'm like, last week before the election, I spent most of my time thinking about how many guns I had and what I would do in the wars if the left-wing people started violence. Now I'm like, maybe I should start a new business. Maybe I should get even richer. This is great. 
Uh, so, so, <laughs> so on a small scale, I mean, that's true for, I think, an enormous amount of people. I've talked to a lot of businessmen, nobody who's prominent, and they're like, hey, this is the best thing ever. I'm, I'm so you know, the, the next four years are going to be awesome for my business. Mm. Because if Harris had won, they would have just put their heads down and realized that you know, the, the people, the government was looking to expropriate their assets. Not anymore. Yeah. So it's a bright new dawn. This is great. Awesome. <laughs> what do you, uh, so when you like, I know you, like, I know you're a fan of Elon Musk and I, and I watch him and I find him an interesting character. He had mentioned, uh, something about starting a new government, uh, facility called Doge, the department of uh, government efficiency, which obviously to me was a joke after dogecoin you know so i was like okay yeah this is funny do you think he'll have any major role do you think trump will like put him as like i don't know head of nasa or something like that and like appoint him to something uh, like that I don't know if wants to be head of anything much less nasa i mean he might, he might want to take like the five percent of nasa employees who actually do something and fire the rest but in terms of his uh, running nasa doesn't doesn't help musk the problem with any department of governmental efficiency is that anything he does will be stopped by the courts. So the again, we go back to the thing, or ultimately by Congress, but initially by the courts. So unless Trump refuses to allow traitorous judges to overrule what he does, to issue nationwide injunctions against what he does and say, you know, now we'll tie this up in litigation for three years, he's not going to get anything. Uh, and so Department of Government Efficiency is fine. But unless you use executive action to crush your enemies, to destroy their power, and to make sure that they're put out on the street. Now, Musk, put out on the street is actually a good, reminds me of something. Musk was saying, well, we need to fire all these people, but we're going to give them two years pay, severance. And it, that is actually extremely smart. I, I like all other kind of bomb throwers, some always, well, why do those people deserve anything? And people got all upset on Twitter the other day when I'm like, well, we need to encourage self-deportation by forbidding illegals from going to school or getting non-emergency medical care. But we also need to give them a free trip back to their own country and 500 bucks. Now people are like, you can't give them 500 bucks. I'm like, I can do whatever I want. You know, politics is there to the possible. And same thing with, <laughs> I mean, the fact is that illegals are more likely to self-deport when they're going to have $500 in their cash when they get back to their own country. And you know, that's just a, a, a strategic decision or a tactical decision. And same thing with the uh, with uh, two year severance. Your average loser bureaucrat, if you present to him like you're fired, he's going to go march in the streets. If you present to him you're fired and you get two years pay, he'll say, oh, well, an important person like me who contributes so much to America That'll be great. I'll get a new job. I'm paying more in three to six months and I'll, ha I'll have this pay. I mean, the reality is that person is a loser who does nothing, who will never get another job. But people mm -hmm. can convince themselves of anything. So these, if, if you if you fire a million bureaucrats and give them all two years pay, it, that's fine. Right. Because they'll they'll go away quietly and everyone will be happy. Two years from now, they may, they may not be happy. But, you know, that's a long time from now. So you might be able to get away with some things like that. But between the executive power and the legislative inertia, I mean, it's going to be a tall order. And obviously Musk doesn't want to get caught up as being a bureaucrat. That's not what he wants to do. Mm. Okay. So I think this will be the last question. Um, when you look at just the landscape of what's, of, of how everything's looking now, um, a lot of people I imagine are very positive. I have still yet to look on social media at all even though I knew what the outcome was, I was like, I'm still going to kind of go into this as blindly as I possibly can into this conversation. So what, what is the mood? How are people feeling? What's going on? Well, you know, it's, it's like the blind men and the elephant. You got, probably ask different people, you get a different perspective, right. especially social media and you have a curated feed and so on. But I, I, I kind of confining my thoughts to, listening to people whose opinions I trust both on and off social media. I think the, 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 the mood is, is uh, uh, more than cautious optimism, uh, maybe incautious optimism without being, without having irrational exuberance. So the, the, this is, I think the common wisdom is 
that a, a moment like this has never arrived in modern American history. Whether it can be taken advantage of, we don't know. And obviously, we're not going to get everything that we want. We'll probably mm. only we'll get less than half of what we want. But even relative to, say, the only possible comparison might be Reagan's ascendancy. But Reagan's ascendancy was in a totally different environment, totally different media environment, totally different American environment, totally different environment on the right with respect to understanding what time it is and with, under, with respect to understanding that people like you know, gatekeepers like Bill Buckley are not your friend and are not the leaders and you know, power is something that is to be used. Those things were completely lacking in, in 1980 America. Mm. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I think after a week, most people are still riding high and I'm still riding high. So mm. whether that will continue, you can't say for sure. But so far, it's uh, it's looking very good. Okay. All right. I'd say one of the things that Reagan had working against him was he had George Bush senior as a, as, um, as vice president and, uh, had he had, had it been like a JD Vance and, uh, JD Vance, then won that election, we probably would have gotten a eight, eight more years. So it would have been a consecutive 16 years of, uh, well, I think the other huge difference in 1980 was you know, world communism was still an active threat. And a huge percentage, well over 50%, because I was alive at the time, of right-wing thought, for lack of a better term, probably 75% revolved around defeating communism, dealing with communism, the victims of communism. <clears throat> I mean, that's all gone now. And I mean, the communists won. They took over Western Europe. But it's you know, it, be that as it may, it's it, the that just the right can focus now on things that matter for America and the future of America in a much more important way than defeating Soviet communism. Right. Well, plug away, Charles. I'm Charles Haywood. Uh, I'm pleased to bring you this message. Uh, I write at theworthyhouse.com where I write book reviews and other stuff, which you don't have to pay for. I also show up on Twitter and under Charles Haywood, The Worthy House, and I uh, offer my hot takes. So you can check them out there. Well, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. And now that we we happen to work out the bug somehow at the beginning, we neither of us know how that happened, but you know it's Trump's America, so who knows? Everything's better. <laughs> All right, but I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>